bad seed well I try to tell her I'm under her spell Not a good witch spell Not a cold bitch hell Her heart's all a gold But she ain't sold It bugs me When she says She's boring, no talent Too fat, too ugly When she's the only girl With whom I want to get snugly <laughs> I'm Lenny and I'm the singer and I got the ten and a half. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> it's really only ten. Okay. <laughs> That's an American humor. Um. Well, I guess, kid. Whenever people say what kind of music do we play, um, I just say we're a bunch of obnoxious punk rock dykes. That's who we are. But we have so many different influences in our music that, um, yeah, it's easiest to define us by our uh, sexuality. Because mm -hmm. that's the main thing that we all have in common and that we always sing about. Yeah. Is, I mean, even if that's not really the subject of the song, it always ends up kind of being in there because we are dykes. That, um, oh yeah, and I was fucking shit up at the party, and my girlfriend, blah, 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 just happened to be there, you know. So yeah, home accord. Mm -hmm. uh, but we differentiate between lesbian and dyke, because a lesbian, that's Alex Dobkin. Oh, <laughs> I'm a dyke. that's interesting. <laughs> that makes me a dyke. The difference is a dyke is probably more punk, more uh, sex radical. Mm -hmm. um, probably has tattoos, piercings, and funny colored hair, but that's just like how she identifies herself as a dyke. But um, mentally and politically, I think it has more to do with uh, radical, more modern thought. Yeah. Well, the cops have come to shows before and threatened to like cut us off. That, <laughs> no pun intended. Well, <laughs> no thanks, I can do it myself. No, um, <laughs> The, uh, the cops come and tell us that we have to put our shirts on. Uh, but they never tell me to put my dick away. That's what I'm, I'm getting a blowjob from some guy and they're like, put your shirt on. I'm like, you're offended by these, but not this. Okay, whatever, pal. You know, so I'm, I'm confused about why people are offended by my tits. But that seems to be the main offensive. As far as the police are concerned. But when I was in Germany, there was, in the Führstrasse in Kreuzberg, mm -hmm. there was a squat that was all women, and there were dykes, and there were heterosexual women, and nobody questioned anyone's sexuality. They didn't care. They were just like, this is the women's movement. I was like, wow, that's so cool. Because I don't hang out with straight girls. I'm like, you're unenlightened, you know? Well, yeah, boyfriend, you're polishing your chains. You know, I didn't really like say that to her face or anything. You know, but I thought, kind of like, well, I don't really have anything in common with you. You have a boyfriend, you know, whatever. But I just thought that was really great that um, feminism in Germany seems to go across uh, sexuality mm -hmm. lines more than we do. Mm -hmm. We segregate. And we segregate everything in America. Well, the first record was all about sex and having girlfriends, and having relationship drama, and sex. And then the second one had most, like, 80% sex, and then, like, I don't know, maybe we had a couple of other songs about some other politics stuff. And then the second one had about 50% about sex, and 50% about other issues. And this last one has, like, one song about sex, which is <laughs> disguised as a song about a dog, and another song, which is a love song, about uh, a girl who thinks that she's ugly and fat and stupid, and I'm in love with her, and I'm telling her how great she is. And that, those are the only two songs about chicks, and all the other songs are about like women in prison, uh, people with schizophrenia, or uh, teen suicide, or all kinds of other political issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've expanded our horizons a little bit. We're not just thinking about this all the time. And, um, and musically, well, when we first got together, 
Flipper only knew the key of E. So all her songs were in the key of E. Because E is a very easy chord, hence the word E. I don't know, E, easy. Anyway, so all our songs were in E. So we, now we can't play all those songs, we can't play them together. We're like, oh, that song just sounds like that song, so you have to put a couple of other songs in between so people don't know that it's really the same song. And now we have all different musical styles and, mm -hmm. and all the songs on the new record I believe are in a different key <laughs> or maybe like I don't know how many keys there really are but we have all of them probably covered I don't know, I'm not a musician so I can't really play but it sounds a lot better now because we've actually learned how to play our instruments okay. my name is Matthias Waffenschmidt and I grew up on the east coast I live in San Francisco for 10 years my name actually is not Waffenschmidt but it's Wogensmith I thought I would be German for you. And, uh, and I did Alpunk from 1991, 92 or so to 1997. And then I did uh, a label called Queer Core for about a year, year and a half. And now I don't do anything. At the time when I wanted to do it, it was very theoretical. And I said, you know, I really want to do this stuff, but there really weren't many bands. And just sort of, I think it was at a time in San Francisco when there was a lot of stuff happening and you could sort of feel like, that it was possible at the time. What we really wanted to do was, um, oh, it would be great to have more queer punk stuff, you know. And there was a little bit of overlap with the whole punk thing and the gay thing. So there, there was some overlap, but it wasn't really a whole lot of bands. And a lot of people would be like, oh yeah, this band's sort of a queer punk band. There's sort of that one, but there weren't that many very good ones. And um, but eventually, I mean, to be honest with you, it really was uh, Tribate and Pansy Division were sort of like. Wow, it's so it's so great, and they both came about at the same time, and they were completely unrelated to each other as bands, and it was like, wow, they're, they're part of the same thing, and um, it just sort of became a little scene, and um, and that sort of started it, actually, it really did. And so then a lot of bands came about because of that, not necessarily because they were influenced by those bands, I mean, everybody's been influenced to them in some way, but also it's like, wow, I could do that. <laughs> what does it mean to me? I don't know how to answer that question. You know, I mean, I'm a 28-year-old gay man living in San Francisco. I like to say that. I mean, I think at one point, to be honest with you, I had the whole queer thing, you know, in the, er, the late 80s, the early 90s when I moved here, um, I was younger and uh, I really I was very idealistic and I was really angry, a lot of anger just, just directed at the world and uh, I joined like the Queer Nation thing and did the ACT UP thing and all that stuff and I was very angry and um, it motivated me to a great extent and I was very alienated and um, I, w I felt that a lot of my anger was directed at what I perceived as like mainstream whatever gay means and that was the time where it was just like we're queer you know queer is different we're not gay and so a lot of time was spent defining yourself against whatever the, the mainstream is whatever that was supposed yeah. to be and I think at some point I realized that it didn't really matter to me I don't really care you know, at some point the whole idea of even sticking up and the whole identity politics, the whole thing, just does become kind of futile and kind of uh, counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Doing like the whole queer punk thing after a while it started driving me crazy because it was just so completely, everyone wanted the same fucking thing and, and people were just like, I, I always thought I was bringing new ideas to people and I thought really successful with that and that people would you know, we're getting into it understanding that, you know, I was trying to give them new ideas and to challenge people. But, you know, after a while I just thought, well, wouldn't it be really cool to like start really pushing new boundaries? Now that there's like dozens of queer punk bands, you know, wouldn't it be cool to now start networking with hip hop and electronic music and whatnot? And there's just was so much stuff going on there and um, people just really resisted that. And um, I felt that people just, now that they had found a little piece of, of stability, they didn't really want to risk anything in some weird way, or didn't want to take it further, or um, maybe they were too comfortable. And um, that was very frustrating for me. I mean, the thing that ultimately makes me the happiest is definitely playing music. But, even, but if I only played music and didn't do it in a community of people that was really interesting and exciting to me, and where I could uh, just learn more about myself and just be around people that I was excited to be around and like a lot of girls that I thought were like really good looking or whatever, you know, I just, I wouldn't want, it would, I, it would make me crazy, you know, so 
like, you know, I was playing in bands before I started playing in Team Dresh, and then the one summer, right before Team Dresh started, I was just so depressed, and I thought I'd never meet any women that I could play with. And I was just bummed out, because even though I was playing music a lot, and I liked it, I, I just, you know, my life's just about being around women, basically, just being around cool women, and I was, you know, and I realized that I never would be if I didn't make it happen, you know, and that was just the bottom line. I just, I was just depressed, I was lonely, I wanted to be around cool women and I wanted to play music and so I realized that I had to play music with cool women because when I play in a band I, that's what I do with all my time, you know. So then once I started playing with them, you know, we were, well I started Candy S before I started Team Dress, but I was just like, you know, I need more friends. I want to meet people who are doing these cool things or, you know, you see people doing cool things and you want to meet them and you see people and they're doing something and it's sort of, it's something that you thought of also and you know that you could really like uh, have good ideas together and have good conversations and maybe make something else bigger happen and you just want to you know get it going so that was really important to me I felt really good about feeling like I could be a part of something that was already going on that was really awesome and cool and that I could add to it and help that in any way I was psyched that was like as important to me as anything and I mean it still is but now I'm like struggling to just like figure out how to be a part of it without being like an active artist. I mean, not that I, you know, I want to be an active artist again, but even if I didn't want to be, who cares? Like that, now that's interesting to me. It's just like, well, how do I be a part of this thing, but not be in a band, not be, I'm not doing anything. I mean, I'm really not a part of anything. I'm just, you know, I just go to work, I do my thing, you know? So how do I keep in touch with people and how do I, just find out about what's going on and be a part of like the dialogue that's constantly happening, and it's a, it's, it's a challenge. What motivates you? Loneliness, anger. Like those are two of my biggest mm -hmm. motivators. It's not happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not happiness. I don't. When I'm really happy, I don't want to write a song, or I just want to you know like go to the beach or listen to music and dance around. For, you know, for me, it's like, I just felt like I had so much anger. I have a lot of energy, period, you know, but a lot of it comes from just just pure excitement of being alive, and a lot of it is anger, though. And, you know, other people get off on watching you express your anger, for sure. Like, I mean, it's, I mean, a lot, you know, there's a lot of, like, uh, there's a lot of feminist art that's just evolved, I mean, centers around anger towards... I mean, anger, period, but it's expressed in really, like, trite ways about anger towards men or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times it's really embarrassing, but, but I mean, I'm sure that I did that, too. I mean, most and people get excited when they watch it. Like, oh, she cut off his dick. <laughs> Woo! You know, or whatever. But, you know, I'm sure, like, a lot of times I was doing things that were just equally, just like, fucking A, we're women, we're great. And everyone's like, yeah, and I'm going to fucking kill that guy. Woo! You know, and it's like, that's, it's... <laughs> It's exciting, you know, it's like I could still see myself doing that and being like, fuck it, you know, just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of energy there, but it's also like, there's something wrong with it, <laughs> there's something wrong, I don't know, there's just, you gotta take it to the next level. It's like I always played music, it's like how somehow the politics leaked into the music or something more for me, mm -hmm. whereas I think for a lot of people that were, that I was around, in that scene it was the other way around. Like they were more political and freaks and stuff and then they got involved in music and I mean in some ways I just think that the the queer punk stuff and all the right girl feminist stuff it was like in a way those ideas made it just enabled some bands to play to be really good. It enabled some music to be really good because it was like a way a way to really like enable you to sing about things that actually meant a lot to you, which is going to make your music amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, Tribate's politics are super different than Team Dresses because for us, a lot of the thing was just like, we want to play music, but it's really a bummer because all the people at the show are guys and they're really harshing our butts. So basically, we just want to be in like a sort of like gnarly, you know, punkish, grungish rock band. And like we just want some really hot dykes to come to our show because it'll make us psyched and then we can like flirt with them after the show. That was pretty much, you know, like, and I mean there were obviously like the deep like 
we were all really neat, you know, we wanted to play with women for all the reasons why we need to be with women. I mean, it's like someone like you could come and analyze, what, you know, why it's important and why it's political. But look, for us, we were just like, huh? Oh, God, they're going to ask us questions about politics. Like, we were, we were harsh. <laughs> but you know what's really funny is, like, despite, like, I'm listening to you say that, and actually, despite all the negativity that I have and all the weirdness and the feelings I have, that's actually like the biggest intrinsic value in this music. And I guess for a while I got really angry because I'm like, so this music isn't doing anything. It's just not doing anything. It doesn't change anything. And, and uh, it gets reduced to its like lowest common denominators. But ultimately the fact is, is like it gives people inspiration and it allows people to at least talk. And the longer you do something, the more it becomes something. It is something and people can talk about this idea. And um, that's actually like a huge deal. It's like a really big deal, and you know, like Jody says, the reason that we're talking to you today, and it's the reason that other people have talked to each other, is based on a common language of music, it's communication, and and um, that you really can't underestimate that, you know, and reaching people who may have never been able to understand this before or ever had access to it, and um, that is usually fucking powerful, and you know, and I do tend to underestimate that, you know. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. Music's pretty powerful. Oh. Behind a plow when I birth my baby in a field. And two hours later I was in a steamy kitchen baby cooking up a meal. I worked hard and long. I had to stay strong because my family depended on me. talking about too with reclaiming your sexuality part of that is that your, our sexuality has been abused I mean not just through being repressed or through the guilt and stuff but also it's been sexual abuse and rape are all ways that our sexuality gets twisted and gets you know tied in with all of these other things so for me it's like using this performance that is sex positive but that also talks about the abuse um, is really important. It's important for me to connect that along with all of, you know, all the other injustices too, worldwide. It's also just our stories. Like for me, it's a lot about my performance and my writing is a lot about just my own expression and healing. And it's really healing for me to be able to be totally vulnerable on stage in front of all these people that can somehow relate or, you know, I can just see, just to be able to connect with people and be that exposed and also talking about something that's so painful or singing or you know being with this group that's really powerful that's also expressing that is just one of the most incredible experiences cathartic cathartic yeah it's very healing and um, you know and it's a way of reaching out and connecting with people and hopefully changing some of the abuse that goes on like mm -hmm. maybe it's people are hearing it and thinking twice about things mm -hmm. and also thinking about how they can you know express themselves and and their, do their own healing in whatever way that they need to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ritual has always been part of what we do. Like we've always 
incorporated that into everything that we do, it seems like. And I think that ritual and theater are very connected, so that makes sense, yeah. you know, makes sense to do ritual as, and especially with healing, you know, stuff like sexual abuse or whatever, using ritual is really important. But yeah, I think it is unique. I don't think you see a lot of it. And sometimes that's the one thing that people are uncomfortable with, is yeah. the ritual. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. people are, that's really the thing that makes them the most uncomfortable, yeah. which is interesting. I am not on display for your amusement. I am not on display for you to size me up. Do I meet your qualifications? I am not on display like my billboard sister who has bought in and sold out. I am not on display for you to yell bitch or baby as I pass on by. I am not on display. This is not a movie. No break for a commercial. I am not on display at your disposal awaiting your permission. I was not put on this earth for your pleasure for your ego, for your pain, to use and abuse in sickness and in health, to love and obey till death do us part. I was not brought into this world to swallow your dominating male standards or your possessive concept of a relationship. Um, I'm Wendy O'Matic and uh, I do spoken word. And uh, I've been doing, I've been reading poetry, writing poetry for about 11 years. And I uh, started here in the Bay Area, in Oakland. And uh, I really, uh, I felt like I was going to all these punk shows and I was listening to all this music and I wasn't coming away with anything um, that I could really sink my mind into. You know, I, I felt like the intensity of the show and I felt the power of people that would connect and. Um, and unite by music, but I didn't feel like the lyrics, like I always hear what people are singing, it was like one, two, three, four, and I felt like women, there weren't enough women, and so then all of a sudden I felt like I could write, and I, you know, I'd seen Lydia Lunch perform, and, uh, and I just I felt like we needed women to step up and, have, and be vocal, and be assertive, and, 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 and send a message, and I wasn't, I didn't really, I don't, really aren't political, they're not really political, although the personal is political. Um, and I felt like uh, we needed to communicate, you know, like here we are all connected in some way, whether it's music or, the, you know, vegetarianism or whatever, anarchism, whatever it is that is important to you, I feel like we're all sort of connected on some level and yet we're not able to share about how we feel about each other. We're not able to talk about our feelings. And everyone's got these fucking walls, you know? And, and so that really, like, was a challenge. It was a test. And I felt like I had something to say. Um, people were willing to open their heart and listen a little bit, you know? Like, we spend so much time drinking and partying, and then we don't listen to each other. And uh, so I felt like spoken word was something that was punk, and I wanted to make it punk. But I felt like we had a community here, you know? And so by making an effort to talk about feelings and communication and emotions, that that sort of builds a bridge to people. And, and uh, that's what I was trying to do. So uh, spoken word is punk is black. No. Have, you, have most people heard me read? Or? And uh, it's dedicated to someone that I really love, and uh, she's not here anymore. She actually uh, started using dope maybe a year ago, not even that long ago. And there was some really bad heroin that came through San Francisco, might even still be out there. And uh, uh, it, it had this, like, you might have read it in the news or heard about it, it had this flesh-eating bacteria. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, and she was like 27, 28, and her name was Stacy, and uh, it was really, it was really, uh, it was really a wake-up call for a lot of people out there, so. But I wrote this, like, sitting on her bed one night, she was tweaking, and I was just writing poetry. So this is kind of a memory, you know, to keep her spirit alive. It's called Theory of Mutation. <laughs> I remember her right hand best because 
I knew it like my own. We shook fists over the same things, and when the radiation fog rolled in thicker than concrete, we shared identical, disillusioned outlooks on our faces. Sisters didn't come any closer. They say you have to laugh to keep from crying, but I need a crowbar to dislodge this wad of pain in my throat. One can only wedge a slice of hope into the gut of emptiness before the curtain falls, the lights go out, and nobody remembers the beginning, only the end. This photograph is a deadly reminder of self-pity. And I've heard of girls who've died lying on their backs, drowning in their own tears, unable to sleep for years. When I first got involved in the scene, there was definitely no one doing spoken word. There were people that I heard about, famous people, like they were in a big band. You know, Henry Rollins was doing spoken word. Although it wasn't poetry, it was stories about being on tour. Who gives a fuck? And, and then there were people who were doing um, uh, political, political stuff, definitely. That's important. Um, but there wasn't anybody going, I just broke up with my boyfriend and I want to read a poem that was really fucking painful. You know, like, there wasn't anybody talking about bearing, like, showing their heart, you know, like, talking about the, the real stuff, the stuff that hurts, you know and uh, talking about suicide or a friend we just lost or, you know, death or um, the painful stuff, like not being able to talk to each other, you know? So, no, there wasn't people doing what I do, although there may have been, I just couldn't find them. And no women, I mean, there would be like one woman would read and then you'd never see her again. She'd come to a show and she'd read once and then it was over. And reading was terrifying because at the time that I was reading, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence, I was young. And uh, I was about, oh, maybe 23. And uh, people were just fucked up. And they were just like, get the f show your tits. You know, we're like, get off the stage. Yeah, people were really awful. They were really awful. I didn't have support. Um, not every show, but some shows. A lot of people would be there. They'd be drinking. They'd be partying. And they'd be like, shut up. Somebody play. You know, and they, they weren't. Poetry wasn't punk, it wasn't considered cool. And so I was there to really fuck shit up and get people to say, you know, I had a couple times I had some really confrontational readings where I'd get there and I'd just be like, if you don't want to listen, go outside. Like, you don't have to be here. Some of us want to listen. And, uh, and I got more assertive with that technique. Like, I, I would get right in someone's face, like, if you don't fucking want to listen, get the you know, I'd be like, and then all of a sudden I got this respect that I never had before. Head people avoid communicating verbally or in writing to others because it's too permanent. Head people waste so much time confused about how to say I love you that they never say it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love you is so inadequate and so loaded that most people, myself included, <laughs> would rather wait for the emotion to pass <laughs> than actually risk appearing the fool if the feeling is not returned with support and reassurance. Over time, thoughts, words, feelings get trapped deep inside until one day you wake up beside someone you honestly and truly love more than life itself and you think to yourself, damn, if they should disappear or die tomorrow, maybe I should remind them how much they mean to me. This process lasts approximately three minutes. This <laughs> contemplation of a real connection is then quickly kicked out of the heart arena and tossed into the brain where it sits for several weeks <laughs> until it becomes so vague, so abstract, that the brain chuckles to itself <laughs> and kindly refrains you from understanding anything at all, including the English language. I don't know <laughs> is the most popular line. I just don't know how I feel about anything. <laughs> or, it's not you personally, it's just something I'm going through, but I don't know what that is. I know these lines, because I use them myself often. 
So what's the point? <laughs> Your brain no. asks. If there has to be a point, then it is electroshock therapy from the brain to the heart to the mouth to the tongue and then down past the fingers to ink and paper. You can't think about this one. You gotta get off the pot and take a real shit for a change. Mm -hmm. Feel it in your groin. Experience the sensation of abandonment, of social control. Liberate yourself so you can truly say you lived and loved and gave without expecting something in return. It's an exercise in being a lunatic of society, <laughs> a freak of nature who can't waste a single minute worrying about coolness <laughs> or being accepted by all the judgmental people all around you. It's an experiment in time travel, a selfless act of reaching out, touching, holding, and then sandblasting your way through wall after wall after wall until you get to the good stuff. The stuff that eyes connected to bodies connected to hearts are made of. That sticky between the thighs stuff. That ain't it fucking great to be alive stuff. That's the stuff I'm talking about, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. That's it. Yeah. my poetry, I usually get labeled Riot Girl. And that's fine. I have no problems. I don't exactly know what that means, except that, in my opinion, it means you do it yourself. You're DIY. Um, you're not out for money. You're doing it because of your, and you're trying to, like, get girls to unite and, and feel strong about their writing or feel strong about their art or connect or have a safe place. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm a Riot Girl by most people's definition. Uh, personally, I just don't like labels. I'm really not into labels, you know? Like, I'm not, I'm queer, but that's not my label. I, w I don't go out saying, I'm queer poetry, because I write a lot of straight poems, too, and I wouldn't say I cater to any one group. So, I'm not, I'm not Riot Girl, but I am Riot Girl to some people. If it's about starting a revolution and getting women more out and open and, uh, in, and in people's faces and heard, then call it what you like. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Girls 
are better than boys. Much better than boys. Yeah. <laughs> It's the greatest thing ever. What? I love my girl. Yeah. yeah, it's the greatest thing ever. So do people think you're a dyke because you're in the dyke band? I, I think every somehow by my breederness, I think everybody knows somehow. I don't know. Breederness <laughs> means heterosexuality. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? I mean, you've seen me play in a number of different bands. Do you pick me out as a breeder, or do I? Well, I know you I are. Think... I'm really sad about it. Aww. I'm very sad. You know, that you're I, I, I'm very open-minded, okay, and I've well, had my, right my well, okay, affairs and stuff. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. You know, yeah. those so, who know know. So <laughs> I just consider myself Mia more so than you do, anything. So you do not go for the label? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't. No labels for me. You got that? But I identify with men a lot. You know? Oh, yeah, a lot. And I love men. Oh, I love women, too. But And I love men a lot. So, and I don't know if it's because I'm Bush. Like, I'm male identified myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. But I... You know, I've been with, with women and I've been with men, and sexually, I end up with men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah she likes you know, That's true. strictly dicks. <laughs> That's what we say. That's what we say. This is Anna Joy. Anna Joy, tell us about yourself. <laughs> um, well, that's so broad. Um, I've been in a bunch of punk bands, um, starting with Blatz when I was 18, and then The Grups, and then the last band that I was in ended about a year ago called Cypher the Snow, and the last band was the only one that was all women, it was also all dykes, and um, now, mostly, I do writing for my art. Anna Joy is a brilliant genius, icon of the queer community and the punk community which intersect at some point, <laughs> with the point being Anna Joy. <laughs> Do you think that um, sex work <clears throat> is, um, is a very big part of the butch femme uh, punk rock queer culture in San Francisco at all? I do. I, I, most of the people that I know that are, well, I don't know if that's true. Many of, the, many of the women that I know that identify very strongly as femme and are really interested in, um, in negotiating and defining what that means to be a femme dyke or if, what, what its usefulness is to, to use the words femme or butch or whatever. Um, most of those women have done at some point some certain type of sex work. And I think it's a really interesting... Um, the field of sex work is such a really interesting place to explore gender definition. Um, you're using yourself as this sort of experiment or this bait to see what, your, what, you, what the signs that are on your body and in your gesture and in your words um, elicit from, from a man, from a, from a consumer. And so you've got all these elements right there to study and try to understand how gender is working in the, you know, in your culture right now. And um, you've got the economic relationship between men and women, you've got the sexual relationship, and you've got all the history of um, what you think men see women as, or what you think men see sexualized women as, and then how they really are with you. And so... Um, so I think that a lot of the women that have done that kind of work have this sort of heightened awareness, at least, about how gender plays itself in that arena. And it gives us a lot of, or it has given me, at least, a lot of ideas about how gender is constructed and how it's deconstructed in different settings. Femmes aren't the only people that are defining what's butch and femme and what its usefulness is right now. Um, I'm just talking about the contribution, the contribution that I think femme sex workers are bringing to the discussion, which is this, you know, which is this complicated thing of like, 
how it, it's trying to see how we've been seen by men, what they want from us, and 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 playing that up to such an extent that we can earn a living by it. And so yeah, of course that carries over into the discussion, you know, into like into relationships or whatever because then I have to say, okay, like what of that am I making up to elicit a response from a man, a financial response from a man, and what of that is something that I want to claim as my own and I would do whether or not I was getting paid for it. People right now in, in queer theory and in queer politics or whatever are like discussing these issues of who are we and how do we subdivide ourselves and how do we find each other. You know, and like in San Francisco, there is this, there are these series of aesthetic questions. I think they're aesthetic, and some people say they're internal questions about like, um, about whether I'm a butch or whether I'm a femme, and it's a big deal here in San Francisco, and it's not that big of a deal in the rest of the country at all. Um, like I just had this big conversation the other night in New York. Where um, we were talking about this, we were talking about the butch femme thing in San Francisco being such a big deal. It really is localized, I think, and I, and I think that um, the butch femme, like butching and femming of people, has gone on in other cultures in other parts of the country at different times in history. But I think that it's seeing this really big resurgence, at least among, um, like, sort of um, lower or middle class. Um, Whiter, well, you know, mostly white dykes. I think it's why it's becoming it's such it's becoming such a big, big issue right now because butch and femme in Latina and Black communities has been like it hasn't been questioned and it's been going on forever and it's still going on. But um, I identify myself as a femme now, whereas I didn't about five or seven years ago, um, I didn't see the usefulness in saying that I was a femme. I saw the usefulness in saying that I'm a person and these are the things I'm interested in. And um, then I think I, I think I started reading um, more queer theory and there was a woman named Joan um, Nestle, Nestle, I can never remember how to pronounce her name, um, who was talking about the history of butch, uh, butches and femmes in queer culture. She started talking about this history of, um, of, of lesbians who passed, uh, passed meaning like they looked like heterosexual women to the outside community. But that within dyke culture, um, they looked like dykes. Now how could that be? That a woman could look like a woman in, or like a woman meaning not a dyke, a woman, a normal woman, a straight woman, in one world and look like a dyke in another world and be the exact same woman. And I think, and she's like, she's writing all these essays about how that was historically. And because of her essays, I was totally, I started really feeling proud of this long history of women who, or of dykes who, um, of femmes who had come before me, and I just realized that I like totally identified with them, and that um, that there was usefulness in my saying that I was a femme. That it was out of respect to these women who um, who had been invisible and and been straight or like looked straight in the past, and who had done all this work, and who had been they'd been like sometimes out, sometimes closeted, but you know who had done all this work before me. I just felt like I owed it to them to say, yeah, I'm also a femme. And, and what that means, like, I don't know what that means at the, at, the bottom, at the bottom level. Like, it means that, like, I don't get, I mean, in terms of oppression, it means that I don't get challenged for being a dyke based on my appearance. Um, it means that I do get challenged as being kind of like a dyke or kind of like a traitor or something like that if I am romantic with another woman publicly, um, you know, not in queer spaces. It means that in dyke spaces, um, I have been challenged for being, for looking like the enemy and for looking like someone who, um, who, 
who spends a lot of time and interest making myself um, making myself look like I want to get men's approval. Um, in terms of aesthetics, which like a lot of people, I mean this conversation in New York, it, it got really heated and it was like people were really upset that I was trying, I think, I don't know, like that they were, they were upset that I was trying to say that there was a political and like there was a lot of value for me in aesthetics. And people are like, well, shit, people are getting beat up for being queer. People are getting killed for being queer. Um, like, basically, isn't that so shallow to be talking about how you now have the freedom to wear nail polish at a gay bar and and still get a date, or get a date because of the nail polish, God forbid, <laughs> you know? Like, and, and I don't think that aesthetic politics or shallow politics. I actually think that when you look back at um, the kind of slander and the kind of um, the kind of hatred that has come towards queer, it's all on the basis, I mean, initially it's on the basis of what somebody looks like. Well, in San Francisco anyway, there was this big, I don't know if it's changing or not, but there's this big deal where butches have to sleep with fem or femmes have to sleep with butches or whatever, and that that that's the kind of coupling that happens. And you know, all sorts of people all over the country like are just all, well, God, they're just like totally rep re replicating heterosexuality and whatever. But you like me, yes, again, it comes down to fucking, and it's like, you know, we give these signals off to each other. We come from a heterosexual, heterosexist society and like we learn our turn-ons there and our turn-ons don't go away. Like I just don't think anybody should have to give up their turn-ons just because of the kind of person that they fall in love with or the gender of the person they fall in love with. And so like if I learned my turn-ons from, you know, reading straight pornography or like or, you know, making out with some boy behind the school or whatever, like maybe I'm still going to be turned on by the idea of somebody who wears little shorts and a baseball cap. Or, like, I personally learned a lot of my sexuality from reading um, pornography that was made for men, which is one of the reasons why I'm so often pro-pornography, is because it gave me so much rich sexual fantasy life. People, hate me because I'm not like them. I can't give a shit where I fit my plan. Casting bitch, show my tits. Don't see my lips or my armpits. What, what do you both think about taking <clears throat> your clothes off on stage? What, what's the difference? Well, when I take... Well, Lynn has really nice tits. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> That's true. I mean, depending on how you define nice tits, but to me, I have you know, I was married to her for five years. Patriarchal standards of beauty tits. <laughs> like the kind you see in Playboy. You want to see them? <laughs> <laughs> There's my scar from my surgery right there. So. Okay. So anyway. <laughs> So now my body is no longer the kind of body that you would find in Playboy. I haven't yeah, yet. Could, they would just airbrush it right out, girl. Yeah, but see, when I'm on stage, they can't airbrush it. So. Red light. But, um, yeah, I it's guess when I get on stage, I do have, like, a sense of, like, yeah, these are tits that you would say see in Playboy. So I don't really have a problem with body issues as far as showing them. But um, sometimes I, I get an inkling that men are looking at my tits and wanting me and objectifying my tits. Sexually. Sexually. And when I get that feeling, and I say, stop looking at my tits. And I just get really aggro and really mean. And I whip my dick out. And then I pull my knife out. And then I just, ah, and I act really manly and really butch. So <clears throat> the whole idea that they have about tits changes because they're used to, they're like Pavlov's dogs. They see tits in a magazine or at the peep show. They're looking at Anna Joy. They paid their five bucks or their twenty bucks or whatever, and they're gonna get their dick out and vixen, you know, and so, right? Yeah. Is that right? Vixen. I know German. So then, <laughs> but when they see me on stage, then I'm gonna totally scramble that um, mental uh, process that happens when they see tits. From now on, when they see tits, they're gonna have total fear, and their dick will shrink.
and they won't be able to do anything because uh, whenever they see tits, they'll immediately be triggered and they'll see dicks and knives coming at them. And be, oh, oh yeah, that's no. gonna turn all the men. They're off. gonna start running away, and so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do get, I do feel vulnerable sometimes, but most of the time, I do not because there is a ton of dykes in the audience, and I'm pl I'm playing to them. And I try to focus my energy on them and not so much on the guys that are probably are getting hard on. And I just feel like whether I'm up on stage being totally naked or walking down the street, when I'm totally naked on stage or half naked, I'm just um, putting into the most raw physical terms what um, a woman is on the planet, in the world, all the time. And, j and having to deal with the fact that, yes, men are going to look at me. When I'm just being my regular but self walking down the street, I've got a shirt on that doesn't really accentuate my tits. I have short hair. I'm really butch and dikey. And guys don't usually pick up on me. And so I get to, even though I am oppressed as a visible dyke, because I'm not a femme, I'm obviously a dyke, I get less harassment on the street. So I can kind of ignore and deny the fact that men do um, think horrible thoughts about women and think about jumping on them and fucking them every time they see girls walking down the street in a dress like Anna Joy. So when I get out there and be naked on stage, I think I'm kind of being in solidarity with uh, woman, all women that are not able to hide in a butch disguise like me that are constantly objectified. So I'm sort of offering myself up as like a sacrifice at the same time that I'm like being totally aggro and attacking them and being aggressive and scaring the shit out of them. So two things are happening at the same time. And I'm not saying that just because I'm running around up there acting confident that I always feel totally confident and I always feel totally protected. Although I do feel protected because there's usually like 20 or 50 dykes and I know that, okay, if that one guy back there is like getting a hard on, and if he did try to grab me or do anything, that all I'd have to do is point him out, and like 20 dykes would jump on him and beat the shit out of him. And so I feel, it kind of brings out, it makes me feel strong, and it builds, a, it ma makes me feel like I have a s strength and a bond community with the rest of the dykes. How do you feel when you get naked on stage, Yeah. Or did you well, already, what's yeah, the difference? I mean, like, I don't get naked on stage as much as possible. The only times that I've gotten naked on stage have been a total accident or I was too high to know better or it was just so fucking hot that I couldn't deal. Like, you know, there was there have been some shows that are like, I don't know, centigrade, but like, fucking hot. Can't deal hot. Take everything off as soon as possible. Hot. And, um, I mean, but, like, you always know as a woman, you're not just taking off your shirt because you're hot. You don't have that sense of privilege that, like, you know, that guys do when they take off their shirt when it's hot. You always know that you're showing tits. And, like, for me, I, I like it when... I like it when women don't expose their tits in any way but a sexual way because I eroticize tits. And <laughs> so, like, I love it when I get to be the special receiver of this thing that nobody else gets to see. You know, like, there was a time where I was a stripper for a while, so I was used to being naked in front of people, and my body had this whole different, um, I objectified myself in this whole different way than I did when I wasn't doing sex work. So if I was on stage and I took off my clothes then, like, I would, when I was working in the sex industry, I would, like, really want to believe that I was doing something very different on stage, being naked, performing you know, in a punk band than if I was naked on stage at a peep show. I mean, the first time I got naked on stage, it was like a total... I just started getting so mad at, because Jesse was always getting naked on stage. And, um, <laughs> like, he just seemed to have all the attention all the time, and I thought that, like, it was, like, my feminist duty to, like, get as much attention <laughs> as him. And, like, because the boy, you know, like, we would be so fucked up and we would, like, you got to understand this band. It wasn't like, we're going to play the music, we're this nice band, we're going to shout angry politics kind of activist band. We were, like, wasted out of our minds. There was garbage that people threw at us up to the ceiling. We were throwing, like, cat food and, like, rotten McDonald's food that we took out of the dump. It was disgusting. It was a disgusting show. 
I would get upset because Jesse was always getting all the attention and he would get knocked off stage instantly like first song and totally stripped naked and he'd be running around with his little dick and I'd be on stage hopping there and I guess I was feeling kind of lonely or something. And, <laughs> like, I just was standing there and I was getting so pissed off that he had all the attention and so I was like, I'm going to take off all my clothes too, suddenly, you know, on so much speed and like... And so I take off all my clothes, and then I realize I'm standing there totally naked, and I'm like, this is silly, like, I don't know what to do now, you know? Because still, like, because that made it that, like, people couldn't touch me even more. Like, whereas when Jesse was naked, they would still hit him and kick him and whatever, have fun. But with me, like, a naked woman, what are you going to do? Like, the guys were just all, like, you know, they'd, like whatever the guys were afraid of me naked which that was an interesting thing to see happen like to see that I could cause so much fear but suddenly by just taking off all my clothes mm. and it, I mean that was like my worst nightmare <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>